So the first speaker for uh, this session is uh, Michael Lovak from UT Austin. Uh, his title of the talk is uh, Sweet Schematics, a sharp lower bound and connection to Avila Giggers. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank yeah, your you. turn. Thank you, Chang Yu, for the kind introduction and all the organizers for the invitation and also for putting on a great conference. Really is a pleasure to be speaking to you all today. And everything I talk about today is going, is going to be joint work with Zhao Dong Yan at UConn and uh, is appearing on the archive imminently. So today I'm going to be telling you about 3D smectic liquid crystals. And we've, uh, we're going to discuss a sharp lower bound. And the proof involves a connection to the 2D Avilas Giga functional. All right, so the outline is I'll begin with a discussion of the smectics in the physics literature and then move on to the statement of our results. And then hopefully at the end, I'll have some time to tell you about some ideas in the proof. Okay, so smectic liquid crystals, we're looking at smectic A liquid crystals and those are arranged, the molecules are arranged in layers such that the director is parallel to the normal of each of these uh, surfaces that constitute the layers. So that's described mathematically in terms of this energy functional where the function phi represents uh, the smectic layers through the level sets. So if you see in the bottom right there, I have some level sets, phi equals one, two, and three labeled. Each one of those uh, you can think of as corresponding to one of the smectic layers. Okay. And the energy functional has two terms. The first, uh, you can see my cursor there, hopefully, is the compression term. And it enforces that the layers have equal spacing due to the um, penalization of gradient phi taking values away from uh, one in, in modulus. Okay, so that enforces equally spaced layers. And, and the constant B determines how much that's penalized. And then the second term in the energy here, the divergence of N, where N is the layer normal, is called the bending energy. And it penalizes layers that have mean curvature, since we recognize that this divergence of N is nothing but the mean curvature of each layer. And so there's this inherent frustration between these two terms because in general, equally spaced layers is incompatible with curvature. And the only situation in which both of these terms vanish is the trivial one in which you have equally spaced flat layers. Okay, and that's part of what makes an energy like this interesting to study. All right, so that's the full free energy. We're gonna look at a uh, derivation of it, if you will, that I'll call the partially nonlinear free energy. And in order to motivate it, let's first see what happens if we try and um, construct a linear theory. Okay, and the way that you would try and do that would be to define a variable u that is the deviation from some fixed ground state. So without loss of generality, our ground state of equally flat or equally spaced flat layers corresponds to layers with normal uh, pointing in the vertical direction. So we look at the deviation u equals z minus phi. Okay, and then if you try and linearize the compression and bending energy in terms of uh, this variable u, you end up with this energy here, which is uz squared plus um, the Laplacian in X and Y of U squared, all right? And it turns out that this theory fails as has been observed uh, several times in the physics literature. And it fails for the reason essentially that this first term, the compression energy, UZ squared is only measuring layer distance in the vertical direction. Okay, and you see that some of these layers have layer normal that is non-vertical, meaning that 
uh, the, the spacing between them is not captured by measuring only in the vertical direction. And so this linear ice theory fails, which like I said, has been observed uh, several times at various points in the physics literature. And so the fix for this is to introduce what is called the partially nonlinear theory. And it involves uh, essentially changing the compression energy compared to the linear theory by adding in this minus gradient squared in x and y of u uh, divided by two. And the reason that this captures the essential physics of the problem is essentially that now you're closer to measuring the distance between layers with respect to the actual normal and not just the vertical component. Okay, and the first example of a solution or a construction to this partially nonlinear theory was made by Brenner and Marchenko, I think in 99, where for an edge dislocation, they solved the Euler-Lagrange equation and produced a solution to this partially nonlinear theory. Okay, and this is the sequence of functionals that we'll be working with for the rest of the talk, all right? And for convenience, we will divide by epsilon and B. Uh, you can maybe, if you wanna be more precise, you can non-dimensionalize carefully and arrive at the sequence of functionals E epsilon, which is one over epsilon times the compression energy. That's this first term plus epsilon times uh, the bending energy essentially. <clears throat> okay. And we're interested in the regime where epsilon approaches zero, which corresponds to the physical case where the intrinsic length scale is vanishingly small compared to the length scale of the problem geometry, such as the size of omega. Okay, so we're looking at the small epsilon regime. And the main result from the physics literature, which motivated our analysis, is this very elegant argument of Santangelo and Camion. I think this was in 2003, the version that I'm going to tell you. And they performed a decomposition for the free energy called the BPS decomposition uh, in the physics literature. Um, for those of us in the mathematical community, we could think of this as akin to the Modica Mortola argument for Alan Kahn or the Jin Cohn argument for Avilas Giga, where you essentially complete the square. Okay, so we take the bending and compression terms and complete the square. And you have this cross term that pops out, which is twice uz minus the gradient x and y of u squared over two times the planar Laplacian of u. And then their insight was that that cross term can be decomposed into the sum of a divergence of some vector field psi plus this integral over omega, the container of twice u times the uh, approximate Gaussian curvature k. So k here is the uh, determinant of the two by two Hessian in x and y, uxx, uyy, minus uxy, the whole squared, okay? And so then they argued that if k vanishes, then whenever the perfect square term is, is saturated, which corresponds to the equation uz minus gradient u squared over two plus or minus epsilon Laplacian u equals zero. Whenever that is zero, then the only contribution to the free energy is this divergence of psi. And so the energy reduces to boundary terms, which if you're minimizing under fixed uh, boundary conditions, um, then you've found a minimizer essentially because Solving this equation and having vanishing Gaussian curvature implies that um, the energy is determined and must be a minimizer. Okay, and they call this the BPS solution. And as they observed, there's a very nice physical interpretation of this solution uh, to this differential equation. And that's that in order to minimize the frustration between the bending and compression energies, we should equate them, okay? In other words, a squared plus b squared is minimized by two ab when a and b are equal. Okay, and we'll, we'll call that equipartition of energy 
between the bending and compression terms. Okay, and it, the argument relies on this K being approximately zero, otherwise that last term contributes to the free energy. Okay, so that's a crucial part of the argument. Now, the interesting part is that nevertheless, despite the fact that the argument seems to require that K vanishes or is close to zero, they observe that, I'll quote them directly, further study is needed. It is often the case that near BPS solutions are remarkably good approximates. Okay, so I think they ran some numerical simulations and determined that it seems to be the case that these BPS solutions are approximately minimizing even in the regime where the Gauss curvature is not zero. Okay, and that's the part of the story where um, we, we looked at it and thought that maybe perhaps some analysis could yield uh, an explanation of this phenomenon. Okay, and that's a good time now to state our main result, which in this language can be phrased as if as epsilon goes to zero, epsilon times the integral of the Gaussian curvature is approximately zero, then equipartition is optimal. Okay, so in some sense, we've replaced the condition that the integral of the Gaussian curvature is approximately zero with the condition that it blows up less fast than one over epsilon, which is very mild. And you might ask, uh, can we determine when this happens or you know, enforce some condition to ensure that epsilon k epsilon goes to zero? And k epsilon is a, is a divergence and so by, stimulate, by stipulating that the boundary conditions essentially don't blow up faster than one over epsilon, uh, I think it's in the H one half norm, you can then uh, ensure that this quantity goes to zero as well. Okay, so this can actually be enforced by boundary conditions. All right, so that's our main result. And let's now phrase it a little bit more precisely. Okay, so we're gonna have a matching upper and lower bound. And the lower bound states that if I have convergence at the level of gradients in these two topologies, and I'll explain them later. And let's say for the sake of argument, if I have a limiting function whose gradient is in BV and bounded, that can also be relaxed as we'll see later. And this assumption that epsilon times the integral of the curvature goes to zero, then I have this lower bound for the energies in the asymptotic limit epsilon to zero by here J sub nobly u is the jump set of the BV function nobly u. And then this energy density, which is uh, the fourth power of the gradient of the, of, of the planar gradient, the jump divided by 12 times the jump in the full gradient, okay? And that's integrated with respect to the two-dimensional Hausdorff measure over this uh, generalized surface in some sense, J sub W. Okay. And then to match it to an upper bound, we're gonna say that conversely, if I have a U whose gradient is in BV and L infinity, then I can construct the sequence that approximates U such that the energies of my approximating sequence approach this uh, limiting energy that, that we derived in the last slide. Okay, so at least in the case where the limiting gradient is in BV and L infinity, we've derived matching upper and lower bounds. Okay, and as a consequence, we can say that if I have a sequence of minimizers whose gradients approximate a BV function, and whose curvatures don't blow up too fast as epsilon goes to zero, then equipartition of energy is indeed optimal. Okay, and this essentially comes from the fact that we completed the square and, and the perfect square has to vanish. Okay, so uh, this does indeed explain in some sense the observed robustness of these BPS solutions. All right, and in the remaining half, I'd like to tell you about some ideas of the proof. Okay. Now, 
the beginning of the proof, in some sense, is the identification of this connection between our 3D Smectix model and a 2D model that's very well studied in the math literature called the Avilas Giga model. All right, and I've written the functional here, uh, maybe up to some constants, the one fourth, maybe. It looks like one half the integral over the planar domain omega prime of one minus gradient u squared over four epsilon plus epsilon times the square of the planar Laplacian. You, you also might be familiar with versions of this energy that have the uh, full, the square of all the entries of the Hessian. Um, and those two energies are equivalent up to a boundary term. Uh, so we'll, we'll, without loss of generality, work with the version of, of Avila Ski that has this um, elastic energy. Okay, so this is a 2D model, very well studied in the math community. And what's the link between that and our 3D model? Well, it's, it's very simple. If we assume that in our 3D model, we're on a cylinder, okay, so omega prime cross the unit interval, we have a cylinder of height one, and we restrict ourselves to functions whose z derivatives are uniformly equal to one half, then what happens to our 3D energy? Uz is one half, and so I pull that out, and that gives me the one fourth, and the integration over the cylinder of height one now reduces the integration over a planar domain because I've eliminated uh, dependence of the gradient of u on z. So now gradient u doesn't depend on z. And I have that this is equal to the avilas giga energy. Okay, so the title of the slide sums it up in some sense. 2D avilas giga is in fact a special case of this 3D Smectix model. And this is what inspires the analysis because there's very uh, beautiful work that's been done in the Vila Skiga uh, achieving matching upper and lower bounds uh, in the case where the limiting gradient is in BV. Okay. And so I'm going to tell you how we um, use those type of ideas in this 3D model. Okay. So this one slide here is the heuristic proof of the lower bound. And it's dependent on this family of what is called entropies based on uh, the 2D so-called Jin cone entropies. So Jin and cone uh, use these vector fields in 2D uh, to derive the, the lower bound for Vilas Giga. And then Vilas and Giga also use them to generalize uh, to the case where the domain is not a box, I think. But anyways, we define these vector fields. And the important calculation is that the divergence of one of these vector fields gives us uz minus gradient in x and y of u squared over two times uh, the difference of these second derivatives, u c c minus u eta eta. Okay, and here we have a positively oriented orthonormal basis of R3, c eta and E3. Okay, and then similar to the BPS decomposition or by Young's inequality, you say that this is bounded from above by um, something that looks very much like our energy density for the partially nonlinear theory, up to this fact that we have the pesky minus sign there, which can be handled by introducing a curvature term. Okay, so this is bounded from above by substituting that with the planar Laplacian and then subtracting two epsilon times the Gaussian curvature. And this is essentially where the restriction that epsilon times the Gaussian curvature approaches zero comes from because it pops out in this inequality. Okay, and I should say that um, in the case where uz is equal to one half and we're on a cylindrical domain, these entropies are exactly the Jin cone entropies, the first two components. Okay, so there is this third component because we're in 3D, but they do in fact reduce to the Jin cone entropies um, when UZ is equal to one half and you look at just these first two components. All right, so that holds for any choice of this basis, 
which indicates that in some sense, the lower bound, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, is essentially the supremum of all the versions of the divergence of these vector fields. So I look at all possible combinations of these C and eta, and I take the supremum of their divergences, it should bound my energy from below up to the curvature term. Okay, and I put that in quotes because technically um, you should formulate that distributionally, but the moral of the story is that this is in effect the correct lower bound. Okay, so this is a heuristic proof of the lower bound. So let me tell you a little bit more um, detailed story here. The, the proof essentially proceeds through the 3D version of what in 2D is known as the Avilas Giga space. And so we'll call this the 3D Avilas Giga space. And it's the set of functions such that if I look at these divergences uh, for any choice of orthonormal basis, positively oriented, that I get a measure, a, a finite rate on measure. And here now we return to the question of these topologies, W1 three halves on all three components of the gradient or on all three components of U plus that the planar gradient is in L3. Why those topologies? It's because if I wanna take a distributional divergence of sigma of nabla U, I should have that sigma of nabla U is in L1, an L1 function. And by Helder's inequality, those are exactly the right bounds to ensure that each of these components is an L1 function. Okay, so the choice of topologies is very natural. It, it's what allows each of these entropies, so to speak, give me an L1 function. Okay, and that's uh, what we'll call the 3D Avilas Giga space. And so um, similar to this, um, paper in 2D of Ambrosio, Delellis, and Montegazza, we're able to define this vector valued rate on measure I of U, which is the divergence of just two of these entropies, the one corresponding to the standard basis in R2, E1, and E2, um, plus the one corresponding to the uh, rotated version of that by 45 degrees. So I've drawn the picture here. Uh, that's, we'll call epsilon one and epsilon two, and hopefully you'll forgive my abusive notation there with epsilon. Um, but that was the notation used in 2D, and in the spirit of uh, continuing that, that's the notation that we'll use. Okay, and again, I've, I've suppressed here the dependence of this entropy on Z, because all of our family of entropies uh, have essentially similar components in the Z direction, or at least in the choice of basis, they have uh, z, z hat as a basis vector, okay? And the, the calculation that you can make then is that this supremum of all these divergences over all choices of C and eta is in fact nothing more than the total variation of this vector measure I of u. And you can think of this as a, a Vilas Giga version of the fact that in the plane, I only need ux and ui to recover all of my partial derivatives. So in some sense, I only need two entropies to recover the whole family of them. Um, you can prove that any other entropy is a linear combination of uh, those two. And this indicates then that this i of u, the total variation, is the lower bound for e epsilon. And like I said, um, we don't actually need that the limiting function is, uh, has gradient in BV to make this lower bound, okay? You can repeat the argument from the last slide, bounding the epsilon energies from below by this total variation of I of U, and then use standard lower semi-continuity arguments to show that uh, this does indeed give us a lower bound, okay? And, uh, to bring us back full circle to the upper and lower bound expressions, you can then just calculate uh, 
that uh, when U is in BV, or excuse me, novel U is in BV and bounded. So that's what you need to apply some chain rule um, in BV. And UZ is equal to one half the square of the planar gradient of U. Then this total variation measure I of U is indeed given by that expression, which is this jump to the fourth and just the planar component divided by 12 times the full jump. And I should also mention that again, uh, unsurprisingly, this reduces in 2D to the cubic line energy derived by Jin and Cohn. Because when gradient U doesn't depend on Z, you can just put X and Y in both the numerator and denominator, and the four minus one gives you the power three. Okay, so it's a, a 3D version of that cubic line energy uh, from Avila's Giga. And another interesting fact is that um, it turns out, unsurprisingly, I guess, that if you try and pass the limit in the BPS decomposition and derive a limiting energy, you do indeed get the same limiting energy, even though the entropy is totally different. Okay, so the psi that Santangelo and Kamian considered is completely different from this infinite family of sigmas. But in the limit, at least when there's vanishing Gaussian curvature, you can pass the limit in their entropy and derive this energy. And I say it's unsurprising because um, both arguments are predicated on the idea that equipartition of energy is optimal. So they should give the same limiting form of the energy uh, in the case where both arguments apply. Okay, so last slide here, just a couple of uh, further remarks. The upper bound proceeds by appealing to this very general theorem of Polyakovsky, where um, he basically mollifies the limiting element to construct a recovery sequence. And he does it for any energy that looks roughly like uh, the R type of energies. So something like Avilas Giga or Alan Kahn, et cetera. And so it's kind of just one of these things you can plug into and um, it spits out the, the upper bound. And finally, here in the last, I guess, one or two minutes, I'll say that we do have a compactness result where if you take an energy bounded sequence, and right now we also have some technical assumptions that perhaps could be weakened, but we're not, we're not sure yet, that uh, you can indeed extract a conversion subsequence. Um, so in 2D, this was done uh, by two separate groups, Desimone, Cohn, Mueller, and Otto, and uh, Ambrosio, De Lillis, and Montegazza. And um, we have some version of that argument as well, uh, although it proceeds a little bit differently because of uh, these difficulties in 3D. For one, the zero set of the potential is unbounded. UZ equals uh, the square of the planar gradient of uh, U. So the fact that that set is unbounded uh, means that we're going to have to assume something. Um, and, and we do have those assumptions on our compactness result. So I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And let me know if there's any questions.